When I was a kid, sports were incredibly important to me. I would play soccer, and then basketball, and then baseball. The next year, soccer, and then basketball, and then baseball. And over and over and over again. Now, I got to tell you, I wasn't really good at any of those sports, but I kept trying. I kept plugging along. And as I got into middle school, I started looking forward to high school and the wide range of sports beyond soccer, basketball, and baseball. I began to look at all of the different options that would be out there for sports, and I tried most of them. The spring season of my sophomore year, I decided to go out for track and field, where you could run a 50-meter dash, you could do a relay, you could jump hurdles, you could run two miles, you could do shot put, discus, long jump, high jump, or pole vault. Pole vault, that one stood out to me. How cool would it be to to be able to fling yourself through the air over a a bar? So that's what I did. I went out for pole vault. Having no idea whatsoever how I would do, I grabbed a 12-foot pole, went to the end of a runway, sprinted 140 feet, placed the pole in a box, watched it bend and flip me right underneath a pole that I had to try to get over. When I was at the end of that runway and I looked down at this pole, it seemed like the height was unachievable. It seemed like there's absolutely no way I'm going to get there. And the reality is that it looked that way when the height was 8 feet. And it looked that way when the height was 9 feet and 10 feet and 11 feet. And I, to the best of my recollection, will say that I got about 12 feet as the height that I was able to get. And each time I looked at that pole, it looked like there's no way I can get there. Now, just to be clear, 12 feet's not that high. Uh, In in my high school environment, my teammates were going 14 and 15 feet. The national record is 19 feet, 10 inches. So I'm not bragging about that. But there's a thing there, that when I saw that pole up here, I thought there's no way I'm going to get there. But it really caused me to strive for more. Christianity is about trying to be like Jesus. And the reality is that not only is the pole higher than 12 feet, it's it's impossible for us to ever get there. Paul, in his first letter to um, the church at Corinth, says, and now these three remain, faith hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. As we look at our goal being being like Jesus, we need to understand in love, our goal is to be like Jesus. Ephesians 4.13 says that we are to strive to become mature, attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So that's in everything that we do in all of our life. That is our goal. Our goal is to reach the full measure of Christ. Lofty goal, unachievable goal, but a goal nonetheless. And it is my prayer as we talk about love today that that would be your goal. As you say the three words, I will love, you make your goal to love like Jesus. Now, most of us know about love. From a very early age, love is instilled in us. Our parents tell us they love us before we even understand what they're saying. We're told to to love our siblings, our, our aunts and our uncles and our grandparents all tell us they love us. We know about love. Just as Paul talked about love, so Jesus talked about love. When he was asked what the greatest command is, he responded in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment than these. 
And I truly believe that our love for God will be seen, will be visible, will be known by our love for other people. I truly believe that the word love is probably one of the most overused yet under-practiced words in our language. We love our spouse. We love our children. We, we love our friends, our neighbors, our job, our car, our sports teams. We dilute the meaning of love when we use it often so recklessly. I've even heard people say that they love tacos. Okay, that one's good. That one's appropriate. But the reality is that we use love in many of the wrong ways. And I think when we use it so freely, we truly lose its biblical meaning. As we continue in our study of Romans, Paul paints a picture of what love is and what love should be. In Romans 12, which is where we're going to spend most of our time today, verse 9, Paul says, love must be sincere. The word sincere kind of comes as an antithesis or an antonym to a Greek word, hupokrenomi, which means to impersonate someone or to play a part. Sincere love, which is the antonym or the opposite of that, means to be genuine, to be authentic. Sincere love is more than a feeling. Sincere love is an attitude. Sincere love leads to actions. In fact, love must be both sincere and visible. As I said earlier, and as I will keep saying, the goal of us in the Christian world is to become as much like Jesus as possible, to, to attain the full measure of Jesus, which again, it's unachievable and unattainable, but a goal nonetheless. We read in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is not just Jesus saying, I love you. This is Jesus showing us through his actions that he loves us. We read in 1 John 3, 18, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. The call on us as we seek to live out love is to make it sincere and visible. People in our lives, and in our families, in our workplaces, in our communities, around our country should know that we love by looking at our actions, by seeing within us how we demonstrate our love as we seek to follow the example of Jesus. As sincere love is really about an attitude, I want to spend a little bit of time of looking at Romans 12 and sincere love. Paul goes on to say, sincere love hates evil. Romans 12, 9, the second part, it says, hate what is evil and cling to what is good. I think often we look at words like hate and evil and we go to extremes. And I think sometimes we allow it to excuse us personally from our involvement or attachment. Jesus addresses this in the Sermon on the Mount and in Matthew 5, verses 21, we read, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. I think for, for me and for many others, it's easy for us to, to stop right there and say, I must not do evil, I must not do wrong because I don't murder. And I think we, we look to set ourselves or let ourselves off the hook. But Jesus continues and he says, but I tell you, that's something that Jesus did quite regularly. He says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. What he's saying here is that 
We can't just look at murder. We can't just look at the extremes and say, okay, we're off the hook. But we have to look at our attitudes. We have to look at our approach. We have to look at the way we handle our feelings towards others and see those as well as evil and sinful. See, evil can be a lot of different things. Evil can be thoughts. Evil can be words. And evil can be actions. To hate evil is simply more than avoiding it. It is doing something about it. Romans 12, 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And if we go back to verse 9, it says, Sincere love clings to what is good. I have this vision of what it means to cling on to something, and I've had an opportunity to teach a few of my kids how to swim. And in the swimming pool, as they're just learning how to be comfortable in the water, they hold on to me with such aggressiveness that there's no way they're going to let go. That gives me this picture of what it means to cling. It's to hold on to with dear life. Not, Not to casually pursue good, but to cling on to it, to hold on tightly. In our lives, as we hate evil and cling to good, people will see in us something different. They'll see a different way about us and a different way that we we approach this life, how we approach people in our world. Sincere love is how we do that. Authentic, genuine love. Sincere love is... It's not prideful. Sincere love is, in fact, humble. Romans 12.10 says, Honor one another above yourselves. In Romans 12.16 says, Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. And just as I talked about murder and and anger and how we can let ourselves off, the reality is that we can let ourselves off here as well. I think we can look at the opposite of humility or being humble as being prideful or boastful. In fact, right here, Paul used the word conceited. To be arrogant, to think incredibly highly of oneself. And I think we can look at ourselves and say, well, I don't do that. I don't go around bragging about myself, so I must be humble. But I think when we do that, we we miss out on some key things. When God is talking about humility, he's talking about something different. You see, Jesus, who is God in flesh, came to this earth. He has every right to think of himself as highly. He... He created all. He is the Lord of all. He's the God of all. Yet Jesus himself, as we read in 5.8, he demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus humbled himself to the point of death. Death on the cross. Sincere love that is humble can look a lot of different ways. For most of us, we'll never have to give up our life for other people. But what about if we just give up the remote control when we're watching TV? What about when your family is going to go do an activity or an event that someone else gets to choose what happens? Maybe in your home, it's deciding what's for dinner. Maybe on the roadway, it's giving the right of way to someone else or responding differently when someone doesn't give us the right of way. Sincere love that is humble can look a lot of different ways in our lives. But I truly believe it has to be intentional and it has to be deliberate. Again, in Romans 12, 10, it says, honor one another above yourselves. The truth is we need to put other people first. And when we put other people first, in whatever situation we find ourselves in life, then our sincere love is truly 
humble. Sincere love is generous. We read in Romans 12, 13, share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. We can be generous with our time. We can be generous with our resources. I have a friend of mine, Jeff, who uh, I regularly call or text as I'm asking questions about something in the construction world. I may be doing a little project or doing a remodel and I'm not exactly sure where to go. And Jeff is always ready to give me an answer. He's always ready to, to pause what he's doing and to give me his time. And as I said, he knows a lot about construction and he also has a lot of construction tools. So sometimes I get into a, a project and I don't have that tool that I need to get the job done. Jeff's response every time is, yeah, I've got one. It's in the garage. Go get it. His generosity with his time and his resources is, is inspirational. It, it's a thing that I get to see that I just wish more people, including myself, would embrace. I really believe that if we are to love other people, we will be generous. We sh will share with them our time and our resources. Romans 12, 16 says, live in harmony with one another. And verse 18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Sincere love is peacemaking. And this idea of peacemaking in today's climate is very difficult. You see, living at peace with one another and being a peacemaker are a lot harder than just avoiding conflict. The fact is that I avoid conflict all the time. I, I despise conflict. I don't like tension. I don't like there to be difficult um, situations in my life. And so I often just avoid the issue. But the issue doesn't go away. To be peacemaking means a whole lot more than that. It means to bring peace to the situation. As a parent, I've found so many opportunities with my children to bring peace. As my children maybe fight over a toy when they're very little to, to fight over use of the car keys. There's so many opportunities to bring peace. In our world right now, there's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of tension. And I truly believe that God's call on the church is to bring peace. To bring healing in the midst of the, the division and the divisiveness and the antagonism. We have an opportunity over and over again on a daily basis to bring peace to our families bring peace to our neighborhoods, to our communities, to our workplaces, and to our country. Sometimes maybe being a peacemaker is a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a person, challenging them on how maybe they're being divisive, how they're being antagonistic. Maybe sometimes being a peacemaker is looking inwardly at our own actions, our own words, and our own attitudes. Sometimes the people that we have in our life are hard to deal with. Sometimes bringing peace is difficult. In fact, Paul says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Paul's saying that we can control ourselves, our attitude, our behavior, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to fix all the problems, but we do have some control. And as we deal with difficult people in this world, when our approach is we'll do what we can, I think quite often things work out better. I believe that God is saying through Paul that we are to love those who are hard to love. Romans 12, 14 says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. 
Paul's words sound really similar to some words of Jesus that we see in Matthew 5 and in Luke 6. Back to the Sermon on the Mount in in Matthew 5, verses 43 through 47. Here's what Jesus says. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is saying here that it's not going to be easy. That there's going to be people in our life that we don't agree with. There's going to be people in our, in our lives that are, that are difficult, that are hard to love. But he's saying here that we are to even love our enemies. And in Luke 6, verses 27 through 28, I think Jesus takes it even a step further. He says, but to you who are listening, I say, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. Jesus says, go beyond peacemaking. He says, do good to those who hate you. He follows up in Matthew 5 with be perfect. He calls us to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. He calls us to do good for those who hate. I'm taken back to that pole vault runway and seeing that that pole is, or that bar is just way too high. How can I possibly be perfect? How can I possibly do good to those who hate me? The reality is that in my own strength and in my own power, I can't. That's the amazing thing about the Christian faith is that when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we're filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will give us what we need to do good to those who hate us and to strive for perfection, to strive to be as much like Jesus as possible. It also may be easy for us to say, well, I don't have any enemies. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 36, that your enemies will be right in your own household. And what I think he's saying there is that an enemy isn't necessarily what we envision today about someone we go to war with or someone in a, in a far-off country, but that our enemies are, as Webster's Dictionary defines it, anyone that is antagonistic to another. That we can find enemies anywhere in our life. And again, when we go to the extreme and we look at enemies as something far off and we discount that we don't have it, I think we miss that God is telling us through Paul that we need to pray for those who give us a hard time. We need to do good for those who are difficult to deal with those who maybe aren't nice to us. It could be someone in our workplace. It could even be someone in our home. There's a great story called The Good Samaritan that Jesus talks about. And he tells this story about how a a Samaritan goes and helps a Jewish person. And Samaritans and Jews did not get along. They avoided each other incredibly. They had varying levels of conflict between them from absolute avoidance to direct conflict. And he says that even the Samaritan showed love to his neighbor by caring for someone. It's a great story, and I encourage you to to go look it up again in Luke 10. It's verses 25 through 37. A great part of that story is at the end, 
the innkeeper, I mean, the, sorry, the Samaritan says to an innkeeper as he drops this man off, here's some money for you. He, he shares generously and he says, and when I come back, I'll pay you anything I owe. Because I believe he was showing there that we are never done loving. Romans 13, eight through 10 says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit murder, you shall, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. I think as we look at this chapter 12 and, and a bit of chapter 13, and we see that, that love is sincere, that love is humble and generous, and love is peacemaking. I think at when we see that we're supposed to love those who are hard to love, at some point we often say, I've done enough. But Paul said, as far as it depends on me, I've done it. I've done everything I can. But I truly believe that we are never done loving. That this debt is to remain outstanding till our last breath on this earth we are to love. Paul writes in his letter to Church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it does not dishonor others. It is not self seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I think when we look at God's word for us, when we look at what Paul said through Romans, and we apply the three words to our life, I will love. And we do it under the context of 1 Corinthians 13. We say, I will be patient and I will be kind. I will not be envious. I will not boast. I will not be proud. I will not dishonor others. I will not be self-seeking. I will not be easily angered. I will not keep a record of wrongs. I will not delight in evil, but I will rejoice in the truth. I will always protect. I will always trust. I will always hope. And I will always persevere because through love, I'll never fail. God will give us what we need to love. If we open ourselves up and make ourselves available, God will do amazing things in us and through us. Every week we put out a, a prayer direction and a, and a live it challenge and a Bible verse to memorize. It's, it's on our website under weekly reading and it's also available on our app. And as a point of moving forward right now, I'd like to, Look at that. And the prayer direction is pray for the heart of Jesus so that you can love people with his love. Ask God to give you eyes to see people in your life that you need to love more intentionally. And pray for God to show you specifically how you are to love them this week. And then the Live It Challenge follows up with that. Based upon the prayer direction, take two specific and intentional action steps to love someone more fully and visibly in your life this week. It is my hope and it has been my prayer since I've been preparing this that all of us would be able to embrace those three words, I will love. Because when we do, eyes and hearts and lives will be turned to Jesus. And he will be glorified. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would stir in each of us a desire to fully love you. 
Lord, I pray that you would give us supernatural ability through your Holy Spirit to love humbly and generously and sincerely and to bring peace into the environments you place us and to even love those who are hard to love. It is my prayer that as we live out these words, I will love. That people will have their eyes and their hearts and ultimately their eternal lives turn to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so glad that you were here with us today. And I have a few closing words. If, if you need prayer specifically about how you can love, maybe you've got a difficult situation going on in your life, or, or maybe you've got something great or uh, something you've overcome, we, we'd love to pray for you. You can call the number 831-221-0290. It's on the screen, and, and we'd love to pray for you. You also can email prayer at shoreline.church, and we'd love to add you to our prayer list and pray for you. If you're new today, if this is the first time that you've joined us, welcome. We'd love to have you text the word welcome to that same number, 831-221-0290, for our digital connection card. Or you can even email patty at info at shoreline.church. And right now, one of the real tangible ways for us to love is through a, an outreach ministry called Operation Christmas Child. It's where we put together Christmas boxes that are full of toys and toiletries and they're, they're done through Samaritan's Purse and they're shipped all around the world with a gospel presentation to children who don't know Jesus. Collection week is November 16th through 22nd and you can pick up your boxes here at the church on Wednesdays from 11 to 2 or you can call the church if that time doesn't work for you and our outreach department will make up a time to meet with you. We would love to be able to use our resources to, to be generous, to love with kids around the world, to share with them about Jesus. And as we go from here, it is my prayer that you would go with the words, I will love on your heart. That you will seek God's direction. You will seek God for opening your eyes to how you can love the people in your life. God bless you and have a wonderful day.